I was up the coast with two murders behind me. Telling all to a nice white-haired old lady when the clock struck 12. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The House That Jack Willen Built. They say the end of an old year and the start of a new is a good time to take stock. Stand back and give yourself the once-over. Do a reissue on that tired list of resolutions. But for a private detective, that routine only means tallying up the times you've dirtied your hands on someone else's murder or dirtied your brain with their schemes. So you let the hide on your heart grow a little thicker, pull the part of your mind that feels things a little farther back into a shell, and maybe plan on later hunting up a cup of kindness or two someplace. But even that has a price tag on it these days. So there was work to do and a fee to collect before I could pick up the tab on an evening's fun. Hey, you're a detective? That's not a fair question. Won't you sit down? Oh, I... fantastic. I tell you, I'm going crazy with this, with this horrible trick of fate. What's the matter? What's going the on? The house, it's gone. It's vanished. What it's house? All the papers with it. Years of research, months of grueling work in the jungles, volumes of preciousness, all gone. Whisk away from the very heart of a teeming city, an entire house. Now, look, if you just sit down and tell me who you I are, I... no object. I must have action. I must locate. Who are you? The... Professor Felix Piper. What's all this talk about jungles and research? Yeah, botanical research, tropical herbs in South America. Years of it all for nothing now because the house has disappeared. Look, you said that several times. Now, look, you Professor... You investigate things. You've had experience. I want to hire you now. I go to where a house should be, a house in which I myself have stood. And what do I find? A vacant lot, a hole in the ground. And all I... Oh, 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 oh Professor, take it easy. My heart. Here, come on over to the couch and lie down. Take it easy, will you? Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Oh, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. It's all been such a shock. Oh, stabbing and sudden death. The long trip to get our papers and then to find the house gone. Yeah, I know. Now, look, if you just lie there a few minutes until you feel better, we'll start over. A little closer to the beginning. Yes, sir. Oh, Professor, what's the matter? What's happened here? Well, the date our house has disappeared and the professor's collapsed trying to tell me about it, and I, uh, you... Oh. <laughs> Who are you? I'm Professor Piper's assistant. What are you assist him with? Uh, Stephanie, oh, I'm glad you got here. Yes, don't worry, don't worry. It's nothing. I'll be all right. But let's not waste any more time. You've got to find out what happened to that house. We've Please, got to find Professor out. Piper, don't Thank excite you. yourself. Oh. Let me explain to the detective. Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. I'm Stephanie Fraser. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please, the house, dive into the paper. All right, the Professor, all right. Yes, sir. Mr. Marlowe, I presume he got as far as telling you that for over a year we've been in South America in the interior of Brazil studying tropical earth. Yeah, part of that got in there somewhere, I think. Yeah, but just of course it did. Uh, tell him about the house, Stephanie. One step at a time, Felix. Now, look, Professor, I've got something here that'll do you the world of good. Ah. Me too, I think. <laughs> now, try this. Yes, Take your time about yes, it. Yes, I will. I Mr. Marlowe, could I speak to you in the other room for a moment? Of course. I'll be right back, Mr. Piper. Yes, yes, sir. But hurry, hurry. Volatile, isn't it? Yes, but a brilliant partner. As I was saying, Mr. Marlowe, we've been almost completely out of touch with civilization for over a year. Really? You'd never know it. Beauty parlors before miracles. Mm. Please, Mr. Marlowe, let me tell you what happened. Okay. Professor Piper's collaborator and partner, Maxwell Stuyvesant, caught fever and died three weeks ago. Where was this? Brazil. Where the nuts come from? Nothing, huh? Look, Mr. Marlowe, they had worked together for years, and all their notes and papers were kept stored at Stuyvesant's place here in Los Angeles. We came here to get that material. And the house was gone. Fantastic, isn't it? Certainly is. We all thought Maxwell <clears throat> Stuyvesant's wife, Catherine, was living in it. She owned it. In her name? Yes. Oh. Maxwell actually owned nothing. He didn't want to. He was gone all the time. That didn't sit too well with Catherine, huh? Right. She wanted Stuyvesant to stay home, and he always promised her that someday he would, and they'd live a happy life together. But, well, she was a young woman, impatient, I guess. Yeah. Where is she now? Well, one of the neighbors, an old woman, said she thought she remembered hearing that Catherine went to Nebraska. Nebraska? Mm. And, and that's all we know. Professor Piper and I are stumped. We came to you because we want action and want it fast. Will you help us? Well, the whole year's been screwy. There's no reason why this should bother me. Tracking a runaway residence through the metropolitan wilds of Los Angeles didn't sound so tough. So after Stephanie gave me the address, 8840 on Orange Drive, and told me that she and the professor could be reached at Villa 3 in the Wilshire Garden, 
I got in my car and drove out Orange Drive to where a house number 8840 should have been. I found that said house had been moved out six months ago. And in the middle of the night, too. But where, why, or who had done the job, nobody knew. Until I got around to a Mrs. Elma Lathrop, whose house backed the Stuyvesant place from across the alley. She blocked her front door with a waistline that said she'd never heard of Rye Crisp. Gave me an eye as warm and as sympathetic as an ice cube. Remember that? Huh. I should hope to tell you I remember. Craziest thing I ever saw. Them men working all day and all night getting that little house up on rollers now to there. I'd like to know what all the rush was about. So would I. You wouldn't happen to know where they took it, huh? No, I wouldn't. That Catherine Stuyvesant wasn't a very sociable type person. But if that's the way she wants to be, it's all right with me. That's good. Now, look, I don't suppose you'd know who she sold it to. Nope. What company did the moving? Oh, wouldn't I, though? It's the Gilligan Reckon and Moving Company, and believe you me, the name fits. Mm. Them clumsy oxes. In such a rush, they backed a big truck over my pomegranate tree. A beautiful, full-grown tree in the pink of health. Did I make them pay? I'll bet. Now, uh, you listen. Have I a choice? I tracked that outfit down and made them shell up through the nose for that. Was I burned? Well, bully for you. Now, look, where is the Gilligan Outfits office, Mrs. Lathrop? At Adams and Rampart Street. 410 Rampart. 410, huh? But say, what's going on anyway? Why are you asking me all these questions? Well, frankly, I'm a pomegranate fancier myself, Mrs. Lathrop. Happy New Year. Yeah, this is 410 Rampart, isn't it? That's correct. Well, your sign outside says Bloopman's Novelties. Are you one of them? Ashtrays, paperweights, okay. bonds, silver babies. Okay, okay, honey, okay. Mm-hmm. Now, look, yeah, I'm looking for the Gilligan Wrecking and Moving Company. I was told they had this place six months ago. That's right, but they're out of business now. They went broke last September. Oh. Boss left town in a hurry. How do you like that? Not much. Mr. Gilligan, Gil- Gilligan owed everybody wages, including my boyfriend. He used to work for Mr. Gilligan. That's, that's how we met Bat. Bat? <laughs> they were moving out as we moved in. Small world, huh? Getting smaller all the time. Now, look, I'd like to talk to your boyfriend, Miss, uh... uh Bessie. Bessie. Well, um, Bat lives real close to here. The Beekman room. Oh, thanks, Bessie. What's Bat's last name? Battenschlag. Who? Battenschlag. Yeah, anybody know that. Well, you better just call him Bat. All right. And, um, uh, tell him to job around, will you? <laughs> Who wrote those lyrics? I wish it was the sunshine and the rain. Who is it? Name's Marlowe. I want some dope on a job the Gilligan Company did, Bat. All right, just a minute. Well, uh, how did you get to me? Bessie. Oh. By the way, she said for you to drop around. Oh, yeah? Dumb dame. Don't I every night? Uh, come on in, buddy. Excuse the robe. I, I was in the shower. Sure, sure. Now, look, Bat, were you working for Gilligan six months ago? Uh, yeah, yeah, why? You remember moving a house from 8840 Orange Drive? 8840 Orange Drive. Yeah. I see now. Oh, yeah, that one, too. I, that was the screwiest deal I ever saw. Where'd you move it to, do you remember? All the way to San Pedro. Big hurry-up job. The boss kept saying we were racing the weather. Nobody could figure it. Racing the weather? Why? It beats me. We set the house off down at the end of Front Street in the Harbor Salvage Company yard. Harbor Salvage in San Pedro, yeah. huh? Tell me, Bat, was the house empty? Well, certainly. You don't think No, 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 he... Bat. I mean the furniture. Oh, oh. Well, why? What's all the fuss? Well, some people are interested in locating that house. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. How come? Uh, I got a big hunch it didn't sit very long where we left it, buddy. The Pacific Ocean was only six inches from the back door. <laughs> I'm beating eyes, mate. What's on your mind? Well, if you're the head man of Harbor Salvage Company, a house is on my mind. That's me. But I don't want any more house jobs. I did one this year, and that's plenty. Six months ago, house delivered by Gilligan? That's it, mate. And I did a masterpiece, if I do say so myself. Sure wouldn't chance it again, though. Too shifty. Never mind your career. What happened to that house? What happened? Why, I loaded it on that old woman's barge. What old woman? As I was saying, I loaded it on that old woman's barge, battened it down, shipped it in the last two days of good sailing weather, and sent her out to sea. 
You mean that house left here on a barge? Ah, uh, that it did, Nate. Bound for the Golden Gate in the upper arm of San Francisco Bay. Oh, fine. Little shrimp fishing town in the backwater there called Wilson. If I remember right, it's on San Pablo Bay, about 15 miles north of Berkeley. Oh, now do you mind telling me who the old woman was who owned that barge, Nias? Not a bit. Kindly old soul, she was named Jacqueline Beatty. Went aboard with the house and waved goodbye from the front door. She pulled out. All smiles, too. Matter, son. You look like a deckhand who's lost his sea legs. What it started three short hours ago was a checkup on an L.A. residence. It evolved itself into a chase up the coast after a houseboat, which was a project I distinctly did not want to jump into without first a nod from my client. In fact, I was ready to scuttle the whole business. So I found a phone and called Villa 3 at the Wilshire Gardens. That's you, Matthews? Yeah. This is Marlowe. Oh, hiya, Phil. What can I do for you but make it snappy, will you? I'm up to my ears. You... Hey, wait a minute. Phil, look, you called up here expecting someone else to answer, didn't you? Who? A guy named Felix Piper, maybe. Nice fit. What's the connection? Client, what fit? Ex-client, Marlowe. He's it. Somebody huh? tagged him. Yeah, with a knife. A very fancy knife like some Indians in Brazil use, the boys tell me. Oh. You better drop in here. Where are you now? Uh... San Pedro. What are you doing down there? Yeah, well, you you wouldn't believe it, Matthews. Really, you wouldn't. Hey, look, Moody. Yeah. See if you can get all of that belt up now. Okay. Oh, hello, Marlo. Hi, Matthews. Any progress? Uh, too soon. Oh. Anyway, I'm counting on you for that. Come on inside, have a look. Okay. When did it happen? A couple hours ago. Mm-hmm. What was his dodge, anyway? We found a club membership card lists him as a botanist. True? Yeah, as far as I know. Spent a lot of time in research in Brazil. Where the nuts come from? Nothing. Oh. Well, there's your client, Phil. Professor Felix Piper, and somebody nailed him right between the shoulders. Hey, Matthews. Hmm? Something's awful haywire. What do you mean? That's not the man who hired me. Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, one fellow who made a New Year's resolution years ago not to get married certainly saw it blow up with a bang a couple of weeks ago. A fellow by the name of Andy, of Amos and Andy, opened his mouth at the wrong moment, and there he was, married to the wrong woman. Listen for Amos and Andy and Andy's Bride on most of these same CBS stations tomorrow night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The House That Jacqueline Built. When I told Detective Lieutenant Matthews that the crumpled form at our feet identified as Felix Piper, and the Felix Piper who had hired me were not one and the same, he arched a single eyebrow slowly. When I told him the rest of the story, both eyebrows practically leaped from his forehead. So all in all, it was 30 minutes of steady gab, my solemn word that what I had said was nothing but the truth, and a blunt reminder that a private detective's license is revocable before I was free to go back to my apartment on Franklin while the police went to work. That made it exactly 4 p.m. When key in hand, I reached my front door lock just as it swung in and away from me. Come in, Mr. Marlowe. Well, the globe-trotting Stephanie. How'd my place care to get on your map, baby? Please, don't, Joe. Come in. Thank you. Lovely apartment you've got here. Mr. Marlowe, please. This is no time to be funny. Why not? Everything else plays funny. Your lost L.A. house turns up floating on the outskirts of San Francisco. What? A screwball botanist from South America who's maybe also a killer... Wants a bunch of hocus pocus papers. Oh, so a papers. killer. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Marlowe? Felix Piper didn't kill Corday. Corday. That's his name, huh? You get around, don't you, yes, kid? Yes, Martin Corday. He was on the floor of my villa when I got back. That's why I came here. The, the janitor left me. Yeah, yeah, I let's I was... not change the subject. Miss Corday, who is he? Or was he? A scheming, ruthless man we knew in South America. An importer. Wait a minute. An importer wants a botanist paper? Come on, baby, tell me the truth. Mr. Marlowe, there are no papers. Oh, that's great. You mean that all this about the house is phony, make no, believe? No, 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 it's true. But? But no papers. Only jewels. Only jewels. Oh, no. Ruby's, Mr. Marlowe. 
In a little pouch. $30,000 worth hidden in the house. Where in the house? The fireplace. Behind a brick somewhere on the right-hand side. You see, those rubies belong to Felix and that Maxwell Stratton I mentioned. Now they belong to Felix alone. They, they were for their old age. Or, the expression's uh, nest egg. So they could carry on their work. Hmm. You don't believe me? No, not quite, no, no. And for two very valid reasons. One, why'd you lie in the first place and say it was papers? Because we didn't know if we could trust you. And now with a man dead, you have to, is that it? No, I don't have to, but I do trust you, Mr. Marlowe. Well, it may not be mutual, Stephanie. What do you mean? Well, if I buy all this, the jewels, Piper and Stuyvesant's unique retirement plan, Corday posing as Piper to some way cut in as a new hooker. Which is what? Corday is murderer. It should now be you or Felix Piper. No. Then who? Corday's partner. A, a swarthy-looking little man. I, I don't know his name. I last saw him with Corday in South America. You, you see, the original plan was that I come up here ahead of Felix. But he, he was too anxious. He couldn't wait. He, he followed almost at once. So? So, somehow or other, Corday and this swarthy man found out about our plans and decided that Corday should pose as Felix and as for their scheme. And, and what? Well, there must have been a double cross. Corday probably trying to do away with the swarthy man, but getting done away with himself instead. Mm. Where's Felix Piper now? In a second-rate hotel on Santa Monica. Phone number there, do you know it? Phone number? Yes, I, I have it right here on my phone. All right. Crestview 8 something. Yes, here. Crestview 8 4 1 4 4. 4 1 4 4. Okay, here you talk to him, Stephanie. My nerves won't take the chatter. What, what, what should I tell him? Um, Mr. Felix Piper, please. Well, tell him for the time being we're going to skip the police. Mm. But you and I are going up to San Francisco on the next plane and then out to a place called Wilson to look for a houseboat. No less rubies. Oh, yeah, also tell them to meet us up there at the Crystal Auto Court. Mm-hmm. You got that? It's mm-hmm. a place I've stayed at a little beyond Berkeley. On the road to San Pablo Bay. All right. Uh, Stephanie, Felix, one moment. Yeah, yeah. Tell them to stay clear of swarthy men tonight. Especially small ones. They're dangerous. <laughs> It was two hours and 30 minutes later when Stephanie and I drove into the quiet fishing village of Wilson on San Pablo Bay that hugged the bend of the sloping shoreline like he was afraid of falling in. Our best bet for information would be the local gas emporium. So I drove my rented car in at a round-shouldered one-pump station. Something freckled and gangling with a shock of flame for hair pulled himself out of a thin... Arms and legs working independently, wobbled over, braced himself against the car. Gas or just information, folks? Don't be ashamed. Everybody from out of town gets lost in Wilson. <laughs> it's so big. <laughs> Made it funny. <laughs> Look, if that's the case, we'll own up right away, Red. We're looking for a houseboat. Yes. Hey, well, then you better try the water. <laughs> this boy kills himself, doesn't he? Look, Red, we're in a hurry. This houseboat belonged to a lady named Jacqueline Beatty. No more jokes, huh? Yeah, don't worry. There's nothing funny about that. Screwy old widow. Believe me, she's sad. Sad? Why? Well, about six months ago, she took every cent she had, went down to L.A., bought a house and bought a barge and put them both together and come back here. To do what? To sit. To do nothing. All day and all night long. She never leaves. You know why? Nope. Neither does nobody else. Except that her husband was an artist, painted sea pictures, so she likes it around the water. But she's nuts, I tell you. Acts like the place is... Well, that's like it's made of gold. Gold? Now, look, Red, tell me, how do I get there? We're reporters from L.A. doing a story on her place. Oh, newspaper people, huh? Your reporters usually are, boy. Well, that's different. Smart, Ellie. It's one block straight ahead, then right, and down to the bay. Thanks, Red. Happy New Year. Yeah, go ahead. John went ahead and three right and were down to where the town and the bay trickled up to meet one another, we saw it. A white three-room cottage afloat surrounded by fishing boats and assorted barges. The front door opened at our knock. Not tugboat any, nor the scraggly pioneer woman, rifle cradled in bony arms. Just anybody's grandmother, and under a white lace shawl at that. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Well, uh, yeah, I believe so. You're Mrs. Beatty, huh? That's right. Mrs. Jacqueline Beatty. Oh, well, I'm Philip Marlowe. Mrs. Beatty, this is Miss Stephanie Fraser. How do you do? We're reporters from L.A. Reporters? Mm. We uh, were going through Wilson here when we heard about your houseboat mm-hmm. and how you brought it all the way up from Los Angeles. You uh, had a particular reason for wanting this house, Mrs. Beatty? Oh, my, yes. What was that? <laughs> well, that's a long, long story, my boy. I see. Well, tell me, Mrs. Beatty, the house is exactly as it was in Los Angeles, huh? Oh, to a tea, Mr. Marlowe. 
Would you like to see it? Oh, yes, we'd love to. Fine. Then, shall we say lunch tomorrow? Uh, well, Mrs. Beatty, we're on our way back to Los Angeles now, tonight. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But, uh, well, you see, I simply have to tidy up some before company. Well, perhaps another time. Well, uh, I, I, I think lunch tomorrow will be splendid, Mrs. Beatty. Of course. Good, good. Then, until midday tomorrow, we'll have a buffet for the three of us in front of the fireplace. Good night, Miss Fraser. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. Good night, Mrs. Beatty. Well, is it just a sweet old lady? I don't know. But when will we? I'll worry about midday tomorrow. Come on, let's get back to the Crystal Auto Court and your boss. The Ellis Piper out and alone is a combination that worries me plenty. No, Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Piper hasn't shown yet, but he should any minute now. He called a half hour ago from someplace in Berkeley and said he was coming out here in a taxi. Well, now, let's see. A single cabin <laughs> for Miss Fraser here, mm -hmm. number six. And a double, number 11, for you and Mr. Piper. Right, Mr. Marlowe? Yes, that's right, Mr. Crystal. Okay. Now, Miss Fraser, if you'll come along with me, I'll show you the way. Be back in a minute, Mr. Marlowe. I I'll just tidy up, Phil. Then I'll come back here and wait with you for Felix. I'm so worried. Yeah, I know. Well, he'll be all right once he's with us. I hope so, Phil. Oh, uh, Mr. Crystal, can I call L.A. on this phone here? Oh, sure, Mr. Marlowe. Long distance is 110. Operator, I want to call a Los Angeles person to person. Party I want is Detective Lieutenant... What? Delay. Oh, yeah, New Year's Eve. Well, look, honey, I'd like to put the call through anyway. Oh, no! Never mind. Oh, 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 oh,
Stephanie decided to double-cross me. After you stabbed the real Piper because he got up to L.A. in your villa sooner than expected, yes, huh? Yes, 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 but she couldn't cross me. I was I was following her all the time. No, I... She didn't phone you from my place? No, 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 no. I was outside your door then. And she was talking to a number she made up. You're lucky you handed her the phone when you did. If you hadn't, she would have shot you. It was all lies. It was lies. The swarthy man included. There isn't one. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Marlowe, he's... Just unconscious, Mrs. Beatty. I'll get an ambulance. Yes, yes, hurry. I'll show you where the phone is. Yeah, after you tell me about the jewels, huh? The rubies, Mrs. Beatty. Your lack of surprise about them being hidden in the fireplace, I mean. How come? Well, I found those six months ago when I bought this house from Catherine Stuyvesant in Los Angeles. By the way, Mr. Marlowe, how did you know that man was Corday? Fireplace, honey. <laughs> he went to the wrong side. It was worth a shot in the dark. Wait. Well, the phone's over there. You know, I noticed the loose bricks on the right-hand side of the fireplace the moment I walked in. You see, I built this house with my own hands. Really? Why'd you move it up here, honey? Because my husband and I spent our honeymoon in this house. And we found our happiness here at San Pablo. Oh. And you also found the rubies and sent them back to Catherine Stuyvesant? Yes, Mr. Marlowe. Well, happy to hear, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Happy New Year, Jacqueline. Well, by the time I'd said goodbye to Jacqueline and walked outside, the first sun of 1950 was glinting across the waters of the bay. 1950. Another chance for Marlowe and for the world. I hope we both do better with it this year. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Howard McNear, Georgia Ellis, John Daner, and Parley Bear. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time each carried a torch, and each was burned by it. The heel, the hero worshiper, and the hard-bitten blonde. And all because of a woman already two days dead. Mm -hmm.